I mentioned uh, when I introduced John the uh, dangers of listening to somebody about going somewhere. So when uh, the elephant was chasing my son and I to his, uh, his mind, but uh, our next speaker has an equally impressive danger, danger level. Jeff, where are you? Jeff Scoville, who does extensive photography and extensive travel, and you all know his pictures. But there's two other parts of him that uh, one should be aware of. The first was uh, that be, when I first met him back in Phoenix in the uh, well, or late 80s or something, my wife really got to know him well because he is an excellent artist. He did wonderful, wonderful wood carvings, especially bowls out of exotic woods. You really don't see much of his stuff, but it's really, really, truly artistic. And I've always wondered at uh, Jeff's many, um, many abilities. But the second more dangerous one is that if you ever visit him to get photography done, uh, you have to be very careful because his front yard is filled with impenetrable cactus. And one of those, I am quite sure, is out to get me because if you walk by his place, every time I go by there, this piece of cactus leaps out at me and stabs me, which it did on numerous times, so I'm very hesitant about visiting him. But he's done a lot of travels. He'll give an excellent talk on travels in Brazil. Jeff? When you're sitting in the wings, you cannot see the pre previous program or hardly even hear it. So it's a shame. I would like to have uh, heard that program, but that's the way it goes. Um, anyway, um, back in uh, 2017, well, <clears throat> let's go back further than that. I started collecting when I was about eight years old. I even had a little museum in the basement of my parents' home back in uh, Connecticut. <clears throat> for which I charge the humongous sum of 12 cents for, to, uh, for visitors to, uh, to visit my museum. I'm not sure why I came up with 12 cents, but uh, anyway. Uh, but I do remember back in high school, I had a couple of buddies who were mineral collectors, and <clears throat> Brazil was Mecca. And to go to Brazil was a great dream. And uh, my buddies never made it there, but I have. And it was many years later, in 2007, that uh, I finally got a chance to go. Actually, twice in one year. I haven't been back since. But uh, the reason for that trip, which is the reason for most of my trips, was to do photography. There's a well-known collector by the name of Julio Lanman who lives in Sao Paulo. And he has a phenomenal collection in his own little uh, kind of private museum in his home. And so I went there and spent several days photographing with him and uh, for him, and then uh, flew up to um, Belo Horizonte, where I met Luis Menezes. Many of you may know, may have known uh, Luis, great guy, great dealer and collector. And then we have uh, traveled from there up to Governador Valadares, and then visited numerous mines. So this, this presentation is about that wonderful trip. And <coughs> In case you didn't know where Brazil was, it's the largest country in all of South America. Uh, the state that we're interested in primarily is Minas Gerais, which is right here. And this is where most of the, um, most of the pigmentites in Brazil are located. I mean, there are some adjacent states, such as Bahia and, and uh, Espirito Santo. But the vast majority are in Minas Gerais. So you've already seen this map or similar ones in previous presentations. So uh, Luis lived in, in uh, Bello, which is right here. And we took a, a few hour drive and ended up over here in Governador Valadares, which is one of the major towns where uh, many dealers are situated. And <clears throat> this is the home of of uh, Julio Lanman. Julio's a really nice guy. It's interesting. Uh, his parentage is, uh, you can judge by the last name, is from Germany. His father came over, a grandfather, and they provide a lot of the makings for making beer in Brazil. And it seems rather strange, but just like Jeff, 
He doesn't drink beer. But he'll help you drink it. Anyway, lovely house, spent several days with him. And this is a view of a portion of his mineral museum in his home. Very modern, up to date, and uh, beautiful specimens. And he specializes pretty much exclusively on, uh, with Brazilian minerals. So just a few shots of some, some of the things I shot for him while I was there. Uh, this is an early Petaniramine piece. Interesting because uh, <clears throat> on the terminations of these crystals, they're sprinkled with a little coating of pyrite. Now, I don't think they ran into too much pyrite in recent years since uh, Danny Trinchillo and company have been mining it, but just an interesting association for Petaniramine. Large quartz crystals is 25 centimeters across, 25.7. And uh, oh, here's something not from uh, Brazil, a nice uh, um, <coughs> Colombian, uh, um, excuse me, emerald. This is an impressive specimen. You don't see a lot of matrix aquamarines out of Brazil, but this is uh, an amazing piece, 32 centimeters high, so that's just about uh, 13 inches. And this is an old uh, a tourmaline from Virgin Balapa. And of course, there's the, as you expect, rutils, uh, epitactic on hematite included in quartz from uh, Bahia, from Ibitiara. And Colorado's not the only place where you get fine Amazonite. This one is from the uh, Santa Maria mine in Itabira. Well, after I took off and uh, met up with uh, Luis, we traveled. Uh, <clears throat> outside of the city to the Jean Mon, uh, Monlevade. And uh, there we met up with a dealer and, uh, in Nova Era. And <clears throat> of course, Luis was not doing this just out of the goodness of his heart to show me around. He, it was a buying trip for him. So everywhere we went, he looked at rocks and bought mineral specimens. So here he is looking at a selection of, of uh, minerals. I believe these were phenakites actually at the uh, home of this dealer in Novara. So the first pegmatite we actually stopped at was the Jaguarasu mine. And this is the town of Jaguarasu, uh, uh, pretty much immediately adjacent to the mine. It has not worked in many years. And uh, it is famous because it's produced probably the world's finest malari crystals. And general view of the mine. And Luis looking at uh, some samples there, there was a new mineral discovered there, and I believe it was uh, it was being analyzed at the time, and I believe it actually was named after Luis. Uh, if I recall correctly, they're just little tiny acicular crystals. But this is the Malarite. This one happens to be from the Eric Asselborn collection, 4.9 centimeters across, and uh, this one is from the Francis Benjamin collection, four centimeters high. Anyway, interesting. Uh, first stop. And uh, so in Governador Valadares, this is the warehouse for um, uh, Geometra. Geometra is the company owned by uh, Dilermando de Rodriguez Melo Neto, generally just known as Dilo. That's what I'm going to call him from now on. That's a name is too much of a mouthful. Anyway, what was kind of neat was we went inside the warehouse. And there was this micromount sized quartz crystal. <laughs> Delos had various mining operations throughout the state of Minas through the years. And uh, one of them was the famous Borukum mine, which has already been pointed out has produced amazing kunzites, but also phenomenal um, morganite crystals. And uh, this is a small quartz crystal that came out of the pocket that produced the giant kunzites for which it became quite famous. This is one of Delos' sons. Uh, outside on the street, we were accosted by some fellow who opened his trunk, and uh, just like at Tucson or most any other show at the Estates, he was, had minerals in his trunk and showed us this rather large twinned hydroxyl herderite. Don't know where it was from. I don't think uh, Luis bought it, but it's kind of neat, you know. Uh, they recognize and they know, know Luis, and he gets offered minerals wherever he goes. So this is the storefront and the business of Vasconcelos. And he has uh, quite a few rocks for sale. 
uh, just rows and rows of thousands of quartz crystals and tourmalines and uh, what have you. It's kind of neat walking in there. I mean, if I had known that eventually I would see this, you know, like back in the days when I was in high school, I probably would have, you know, thought I had died and gone to heaven. But <clears throat> wonderful to see this. And they were operating at the time, or at least co-operating the Crucero mine, and this was a small tourmaline from a, a recent pocket that they hit. Well, the following day, we took this small plane uh, and flew, this is a little Cessna 182, and we flew there from there uh, out to some of the pegmatites. This is a view northeast of Governor de Valadares. You can see it's a beautiful countryside, nicely wooded. We did not go to the Cruzero mine, but this is the Cruzero mine and some of the workings. And uh, we flew over, strafed the mine, I guess. Um, another view of some of the workings. And from this mine, there's quite a variety of tourmalines. You know, some tourmalines from some mines are pretty much consistently uh, the same. But Cruzero produces quite a variety. So this one here is eight and a half centimeters high from the Scott Rudolph collection. And there was a famous pocket found, I don't recall exactly when, but uh, generally the tourmalines from it are known as the, the lipstick tourmalines. And I think the reason for this is fairly obvious. They have beautiful red terminations on them. This is from, my goodness, the Jean and Ros Myron collection. And uh, this is uh, some of the more recent production. There was a pocket hit, I guess, was it? I think it was the summer of 2017 or so where all the tourmalines were this beautiful, kind of a strawberry color. This one here is in the Wayne Sorensen collection, 15 centimeters across. Uh, some of these things were just, uh, uh, out of this pocket, were just amazing. And uh, we've seen this one already, now residing in uh, the Larson collection. I photographed this before Bill bought it for Brice Cobain, and it is 11 centimeters high. And very interesting, this particular pocket <coughs> also produced gorgeous autonite or meta-autonite crystals. Some of them perch directly on these indicolite tourmalines. They are really quite something to behold. And uh, I have not published any of these anywhere. They have not been in mineralogical record because Brees is working with some other people to produce an article for, for the mineralogical record on this particular find. So keep your eyes peeled. You're gonna see some uh, outrageous specimens. Anyway, a little bit further along, we passed over the Shia mine. And uh, this is on the region of San Jose de Safira. And this place, this mine has been producing tourmaline for quite some time, some beautiful pieces. This one's got a lovely rosette of uh, albite on it, 13.1 centimeters high. And this was, at the time I shot it, kind of co-owned by Crystal Classics and Cristali. And uh, another one, this is from the Jeremy Smith collection, 10.8 centimeters high. Um, it actually became quite famous because, I don't know how many years ago it is now, but probably 15, 20 years ago, they hit a pocket where all the tourmalines were this lovely green and with a nice red base on them. This one is from the Steve Smell collection, 15.4 centimeters high. And this is, uh, our destination actually was the Pedernera mine. This is an aerial view of the workings. And this is the landing strip that's been mentioned before, kind of runs along the top of a, a little ridge, uh, kind of an exciting flight. And we were met there by somebody, a, a mine representative in a, in a Jeep who took us to the mine. So here we are. This was before, I mean, I was, it was very interesting since I haven't been there in 12 years to see the photos that uh, Edward had of the mine. And uh, they have made some great strides since I was last there in, in uh, getting sophisticated with core drilling and, and uh, better extraction methods. While I was there, they were just sort of ju just getting into doing that kind of work. And, um, so anyway, this is entering the mine with uh, Jose de Souza, and uh, I don't know who else is being hidden in there, I think uh, Luis, and uh, what the mine was looking like at that time. And uh, here we are in the lower workings. This is with, uh, 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 Ereclides, who was the mine foreman, manager at the time, and uh, me there with uh, Luis. Just to give you an idea what the mining, uh, some of the area, uh, some of the mine looks like. And just before we got there, they were putting in another drift, and they were not expecting to hit a pocket, 
And when the dust cleared, they had blown the hell out of a pocket of tourmaline, and there was tourmaline lying all over the floor of the, of the tunnel. And this is an example of some of the matrix. And if you look in the background there, this is a flat filled with loose crystals that fell out of that pocket. I don't think, I don't know if they were able to salvage any of them or glue them back on the matrix as they usually do. But you've all seen tourmalines from the uh, Peternera mine. They're wonderful things. And uh, this is a piece that happens to belong to uh, the Ark and Stone. And uh, I don't remember how, how big this thing was. It's around. This is not nine inches, Rob. <laughs> 35 centimeters. So that makes it about uh, 14 inches. It's, it's, it's a honker. It's, it's a beautiful piece on uh, quartz and albite. And of course, you've all seen this. Uh, sometimes several photographers get to photograph the same piece. And I did this a number of years ago for Danny Trinchillo. This is 24.5 centimeters high, so that's about uh, 10 inches. Gorgeous, gorgeous thing. This one is out of the collection of Scott Rudolph at 19.6 centimeters high. And uh, there's another, oh, this is one I shot for Brice Coban a while back. Just a little guy, a little over three inches, 7.8 centimeters. And uh, from the collector's edge, 19 centimeters high. Now this is very typical of recent production, mostly green, maybe a little bit of red and a, and a termination here and there, long thin crystals, uh, really quite amazing things. And when they get them all reconstructed, because even if they haven't used a little excessive force and too much dynamite, uh, it's pretty hard for these things to survive, what was it, 200 million years or so in the ground without the crystals breaking off, falling to the, bucket of the uh, bottom of the pocket. So nearly all of them are reconstructed. And as pointed out, it's rare you get one that has not been repaired. Um, now some, from some of the older material here, this is a, a cute little piece at 5.7 centimeters wide from Mike Kimes' collection. And one of these scepter tourmalines that uh, they hit a pocket of a number of years ago. This is just under four inches high from the Steve Smell collection. Now, <clears throat> just a note here about these tourmalines. Uh, they're gorgeous, but you should be aware that when these things were found, sometimes they look just like this with a little stub of a, uh, uh, of the pink sticking out. But what often happened was the green was growing over and hanging around the pink part like a skirt around legs. And to emphasize the scepterness of it, they would often take a little pair of needle nose pliers and break off parts of the green tourmaline where it hung around that to really bring out and expose more of that pink. So just to let you know, they weren't entirely found just that way. I'm not saying all of them were that was done with, but it was a fairly common practice with a number of them. So I don't think anybody should be returning them anytime soon. They're gorgeous things any way you look at them. So flying back to <coughs> Governor Valadares, this is the mountain that stands over the city called uh, Ibituruna Mountain. And uh, anyway, the following day, we hit it out, head out again, but this time in a vehicle. And uh, this is the home of the uh, Rogerio uh, Zolcolotto in uh, Galilea. And uh, we had to stop there. And of course, it's fun. This guy owns, operates several mines. And here are some of the men that he's working with who are doing uh, cobbing quartz for uh, facet material. And we had some lovely aquamarine rough that uh, some buyers are going through. That is, uh, by the way, that's Dilo standing on the left. I forgot that he came with us that day. And <clears throat> after we were done there, we hopped in his, one of his vehicles and took off, uh, went to the Urukum mine. Um, some of you may have heard, seen the, or heard the mine referred to as the Correjo Urukum. And that's not correct, it's just the Urukum mine. But uh, anyway, we get to the gate leading into the mine with warnings about no trespassing, et cetera. And arrive at the mine, there's a, a variety of structures and this, that, and the other. Uh, when we were there, it was not really operating, you know, working at the, uh, uh, producing anything particular. Um, Dilo had 
at the time a, all sorts of interests in different minds, and so he doesn't have them all operating simultaneously. And by the way, if you hadn't heard, at the last two, it was during the last Tucson show that Dilo passed away. Only his sons were there because he was rather ill, and they got no word in the middle of the uh, show that he had passed. Um, anyway, this is the main attic going into the, into the mine. And uh, a short ways inside, there's a stope that opens up to the surface. And <clears throat> this is the area which in the early days had produced all the incredible morganites that we're used to seeing on the market. Big tabular pink crystals, orangey pink crystals that usually have their edges shot full of little black or actually very dark green tourmalines. Now, once we got inside, this is the stope where they found the big Kunzite pocket, and that is Luis looking down into what is left of the pocket. I mean, it was the size of a good-sized room. And underground, we see this uh, one of the miners standing there next to a, an exposure of the pigmentite that's just chock full of big shoral tourmaline crystals. And here's Dilo and Luis underground, and looking out the attic. So this is the material that you're uh, familiar with. These crystals can be a size of dinner plates. This is not quite so large at 8.4 centimeters. And this is also in Gene, Ros Gene and Ros Myron's collection. Uh, you may not know that found there were not just these uh, kunzites and, uh, and uh, morganites, but also some lovely spessartines. This one is three centimeters high from the Andy Seibel collection. And it's the best locality in the world for a rather rare mineral called stochocyte. This, is a, this sphere is 2.4 centimeters in diameter and belongs to Alex Schaus, who some of you may have noticed snuck in last night in the middle of the party at, uh, at uh, Rob's place. Um, anyway, the, the localities also produce some amazing fluorapatite crystals. This one is from the collection of John Rackavan. It's five centimeters across. And this kunzite, I photographed at the Tucson show. It's a little darker than in real life. This thing is about two foot long, this crystal. I think it was the largest, best crystal we got out of the pocket. It weighed something like 75 pounds. I had a lot of fun photographing it at the Tucson show a couple years ago. But uh, nearly flawless gem material, I mean. If you were to so, be so crude and gauche as to facet it, you could get stones that were thousands of carats apiece. This gives you just an idea of the main drag in Galilea. Out from there, we went out to the Navigadora mine. I left out the air on the A on Navigadora. Anyway, which is not far from out, uh, out in Galilea, from Galilea. And uh, this is a view from the mine itself. Lovely countryside, and here we are at the mine. It was in full operation while we were there, uh, <clears throat> sorting for mica, barrel, whatever else they could find. That one pocket that we've seen those incredible garnets from, uh, I don't recall exactly when it was found, but uh, produced thousands upon thousands of these etched garnet crystals. And uh, anyway, this is an added into the mine, and then a little, give you an idea of what it looks like inside. And uh, this is not a place where OSHA has any control whatsoever. <laughs> you're lucky if you're wearing flip-flops, the miners. Uh, hard hats were not in evidence whatsoever, no ventilation. Uh, I'm sure some of the bureaucrats in OSHA here would have an absolute fit if they saw uh, that this was being mined this way. Uh, and lighting was also pretty minimal. Anyway, this is a rather typical piece. Very few of them were actually found on Matrix. This one, this was on Matrix. A small one at 2.2 centimeters from the Richard and Safa Jackson collection. And this is a fairly typical piece. Sometimes they're associated with quartz. This is a little bit larger at five and a half centimeters and this is from the Matthew Webb collection. And it is my understanding that, yeah, these images are a little dark on the screen. Uh, that this is due to etching. And the few that have been found on Matrix are usually loose, sort of stuck in a little vug that's slightly larger than them. You see they've lost a little bit of volume because of this etching. 
So our next, uh, next place we went was the famous Correggio Frio mine. And uh, it's famous because it's the type locality for Brazilianite, which was discovered in 1942. It was described by Fred Poe in 1945. And Ed Swoboda, Brian's dad, went down there and actually uh, mined it for a good while, coming up with some amazing Brazilianites. So we actually went to this mine by mistake. We were looking for a, another mine on the other side of the hill and went up, took the wrong fork. But that's okay, it was neat seeing it. It has not been in operation for a while, but it produced some very distinctive Brazilianites. This one here is three and a half centimeters high from Unique Minerals. And uh, they were often on star muscovite mica. This one is from the Jack Halpern collection at 6.2 centimeters. And uh, a beautiful piece from uh, the Phil Gregory collection at 3.8 centimeters across. This is from the John Lucking collection. John's in the audience here somewhere. Congratulations on having such a fine piece. Uh, 4.8 centimeters, really good size. Now, it's interesting that the, they're fairly distinctive, the ones from Correggio Frio, as opposed to some of the ones from, Lina, uh, from some of the other mines like Tellerio and Marcello, in that they tend to be more equant and fairly gemmy and maybe a better color than some of the other localities. And they can get quite large. I mean, I've seen some of them about the size of a grapefruit. So this is going into the Marcello mine. It's on the same hill or mountain as the Correggio Frio and uh, both of which are just outside of Linopolis. So going into the mine, and uh, here we are, we're using the latest high-tech carbide lamps, and of course hard hats and flip-flops again. This mine was being operated at the time we were there, and uh, this is the remains of a pocket in the upper right there, nicely cleaned out. But we did find a couple of little bitty ones, you know, about an inch or so across on one wall, and the miner was poking his finger in this one, and we actually came up with a few small, very small thumbnails, which I was able to take home with me. But <clears throat> this mine and others similar to it have got uh, what we are more familiar with in recent production, which are these more tabular, excuse me, more prismatic flattened crystals. And uh, this one here is from the, uh, from the Marcello mine, five and a half centimeters high, also from the Richard and Safa Jackson collection. And this is from Marty Zinn's collection. And this one is labeled as coming from the Manuel uh, Lorenzo uh, claim. Anyway, from there, this, this is a mine we went to that uh, for the life of me, I can't remember what they were mining there, except there was a pegmatite. So I'm assuming maybe tourmaline, maybe some barrel or something, but we didn't see anything uh, coming out of it when we were there. It's called the Jaime Mine, also in, near Linopolis. And this is a pocket that, uh, the remains of a pocket, there's muscovite in the bottom of it and some microcline feldspar. Interesting place, this is where you park your motorcycle and hang your laundry. <laughs> I think some of the miners are actually living in the mine there, at least temporarily. Uh, somebody doing, getting ready to do some blasting and looking out the, uh, the main at it. And uh, it's interesting that, uh, cool, you recognize that book, anybody? Of course I had to take that picture. Uh, anyway, so we stopped off and, uh, in the uh, Nilsson Palmari home in Divino uh, das Laranjeras. And uh, these are some specimens that were being bought by Luis from, uh, from Nilsson. Um, and you go around the back and you see tables just heaped with quartz crystals. And um, the table in the front, that is all lapidolite mica. And he had an amazing, they'd gotten into a series of pockets, I'm not sure what the mine was, where they had muscovite pseudomorphs after uh, all sorts of things, tourmalines, and in this case here, Luis is holding up what had been, at one time, a spodumene crystal. And uh, it's just a hollow cast now, but it's a mixture of uh, mostly muscovite with a few albite rosettes on it. So, um, that is the end of the 
slide program. I'm glad, I'm sure you'll be glad that I was rather brief and you can get to lunch on time. So thank you very much. <laughs>